So I want to say hello to everybody and thank them for coming. So I know this is a crazy busy time of year. Um, you are at um, what I think is going to be a really interesting discussion on machine consciousness today at the Center for the Future Mind. And I would like now to introduce our speakers. But before I introduce, I just wanted to mention a few practical details. So first of all, uh, our next speaker is Stephen Wolfram, and that's April 8th. And um, go to the center website if you want to register. I am going to be capping that registration very soon, so register soon if you if you want to attend. And Stephen is also going to be talking about consciousness. In particular, he's going to try to derive consciousness from the fundamental laws of physics, which he runs or he he runs a simulation of those in his basement. Last time I checked. Um, so that ought to be really interesting. Um, okay, so today we also have like a really interesting uh, group of speakers. So now let me turn to that. And um, I also want to say right now we're doing this as a webinar, but um, Polly Burks, uh, who is in charge of the technical details of today, is actually going to be moving you over to a more conversational format. Um, so just note that you will be on. You'll be, we'll see your face when Polly moves you over. We're doing that to have more of a conversation. So turn your camera off if you're, if you're, um, you know, uncomfortable. Okay. So now let's go ahead and uh, learn a little bit more so about the speaker. Turn your camera on if you are comfortable. <laughs> <laughs> yes. We would really like to see you, um, you know, this kind of impersonal world that we're in right now. We can remedy that a little and, and seeing your faces really helps. Yes. So let me start with Lenore. Um, Lenore Blum is a computer scientist and mathematician, um, formerly a distinguished career professor of computer science at Carnegie Mellon University. She's known for her contributions to the theory of real number computation, for her invention of a cryptographically secure, wow, pseudo random number generator, and for her efforts to increase the diversity of math and computer science. All right, so Manuel Blum is the Bruce Nelson Professor of Computer Science at Carnegie Mellon. And he is a computer scientist who has received the Turing Award in 1995 in recognition of his contributions to the foundations of complexity theory and its application to cryptography and program checking. Very cool. So we're super excited to have them talking about conscious machines today. So let's go ahead and get started. Okay, so thank you, Susan, and hi, everyone. Um, so let me tell you, Susan asked people to watch a video of a talk we gave at Harvard a couple of months ago, but Manuel and I uh, assumed that most people did not do that. We know students and people are busy. So we decided that we're going to go over a lot of the key ideas. So even if you've seen that film, uh, we're hoping that maybe hearing it twice um, will help out a lot. So I'm going to start. So I'm going to start with some slides at the beginning, and then Manuel will come in later with a short video, and then we'll be open for discussion. So what can theoretical computer science contribute to the discussion of consciousness? Okay, and here are the three authors. It's Manuel Blum, who's had a long-term interest in the brain, Avram Blum, who's an expert in machine learning, and myself, and a, um, as Susan said, I'm interested in non-standard models of computation. So over the millennia, there have been various approaches to the study of consciousness, going back to let's say the philosophical approach, going back to Buddha, Confucius, and Plato. Very interesting that these folks lived within 100 years of each other. Today, we have a lot of philosophers working on consciousness, and there's a spectrum. And on either side of the spectrum, I have Charles Dennett, who one might, we might call a functionalist, David Chalmers, a phenomenologist on the other side, and everybody else more or less in between. The psychological approach goes back to uh, maybe the turn of the last century with William James and Sigmund Freud. And more recently, with the advent of fMRI technology, uh, people were able to look in the brain. We have Francis Crick and Christoph Koch looking at neural oscillations and spikes and how they relate to consciousness. Then there are mathematical measures of consciousness, Gilead 
Giulio Tononi and Koch, uh, integrated information theory, have axioms, and a measure phi. And that measure phi basically tells you how much feedback is in the system. Um, that's what the measure does. So and I think that's important is to manage the feedback in the systems. Our approach uh, really is, stems from the cognitive neuroscience our method of Bernard Barr, Stanislaw Dehaene, and Alan Baddeley. And uh, we're coming from a theoretical computer science perspective. And theoretical computer science is a branch of mathematics concerned with understanding the underlying principles of computation and complexity, specifically the implications of resource limitations. So what can theoretical computer science contribute to the discussion of consciousness? Well, we also want to understand consciousness. We want to give a simple mathematical model to help get this understanding. And we want to give a formal definition of the informal notion of chunk. And as you recall, in 1950, George Miller talks about the magic number, seven plus or minus two. And that's what he imagined, amount of information we could keep in our consciousness, our short-term memory at any moment in time. And informally, a chunk could be a word, a digit. It's not completely a poem, but maybe the first phrase of a poem with a point of the next phrase, the next phrase, and so forth. So you have a sense, you, you know the whole poem. So we want to give a formal definition of chunk, this informal notion. We want to distinguish between simulating and experiencing. We want properties of consciousness to be emergent, not programmed in. We are not looking for a model of the brain, nor of learning or cognition. We are looking for a model of consciousness. Now, that's not to say we're not interested in learning or cognition, but for the moment, we really want to hone in onto consciousness. We're looking for simplicity, not complexity. And we want to provide a blueprint for building a conscious-like machine. And currently, this is under construction with, by our colleague, Jean-Louis Villacros. So for us, the easy problem, may not be for you, is to make a robot that simulates feelings, for example, of pain and joy. And the hard problem is to make a robot that truly experiences these feelings, for example, of pain and joy. And here we have Sophia simulating emotions and she ends up with an expression of pure pleasure, joy. Um, but although her expressions may simulate pleasure, she has acute anhedonia. Philosophers might say she is a zombie. And again, you can have a lot of robots, you can see them on the web simulating pain, but these robots of course have pain assembolia. So our view of consciousness is that it's the property of all properly organized computing systems, whether made of flesh and blood or metal and silicon. And our thesis is it's the architecture of these systems it's key processors that are able to communicate thoughts, plans, images, sensation in an expressive inner language. And what we call predictive dynamics, the ensemble of prediction, feedback, and learning that makes them conscious. Our architecture is the global workspace and some key processors are inner speech, the, our inner voice, inner sensation, and particularly the model of the world that builds models to tell self from not self, and that communicate with each other in an expressive multimodal inner language. And we're working with a student here at Carnegie Mellon, uh, Paul Young on working on a multimodal inner language. But also consciousness requires motivation, a kind of desire and energy and a minimal level of intelligence. So our model explains the brain at a very high level of abstraction at levels well above those of neurons or neuronal activity. And importantly, our model presents a framework for studying consciousness from a theoretical computer science perspective. So, so we give a formal definition of a machine for consciousness, uh, which we call the conscious Turing machine or the conscious AI. And then we define consciousness in that model and then point out properties of consciousness in the model. And we are inspired by Turing's simple yet powerful model of a computer that helps give understanding of computation. And here is a 23 state universal Turing machine, which can compute any computable function. In other words, anything you can compute in the cloud or in a supercomputer, you can compute on this very simple machine. 
you can prove theorems about this uh, machine. In other words, you can get your head around a Turing machine, not the cloud, and know what you can and cannot do. Thus inspired by Turing, we aim for a simplicity, not complexity. And our architecture formalizes the theater model or the global workspace model of cognitive neuroscientist Bernard Bars. And Bars describes conscious awareness through a theater analogy. Uh, consciousness, Bars says, is the activity of actors in a play performing on a stage of working or short-term memory and the inner speech actors often on stage. And their performance is under observation by a huge audience of unconscious processes in long-term memory that are sitting in the dark. So if I was giving this talk on the stage and you were my audience, you would be the long-term uh, processor sitting in the dark. Very smart processors though. So maybe you've had this experience once or twice, you're at a party, you see somebody that you know, but for the life of you, you can't remember her name. And what happens is a half hour later, you're home and her name Tina pops up and when it's too late to do anything about it. So what's going on? You recall where you first met and maybe that's in the psychology class and it gets broadcast down to all the long-term memory processors. And then you recall, one of the processes recalls something about what she does. Oh, she's interested in consciousness and that gets broadcast down to all the long-term memory processors. And then one processor pipes up and her name begins with T and that gets broadcast down and you remember that her name was Tina. So um, the conscious self on stage doesn't know how or where her name was found. The conscious self is not privy to the workings of the unconscious self. So here is a, a, a picture of Barr's model of consciousness. And here in the center, he has his working storage, which is his stage. And down below, we have a large collection of long-term memory processors, um, each uh, doing their own task. They're powerful. There are many of these. And that's the audience. And on the left, we have input coming in from the outside world through sensors, vision, hearing, touch. And it's going to short-term memory. And on the right, we have outputs going from short-term memory out to uh, actuators that create actions in the world. And right in the middle, we have a central executive that's sort of orchestrating the activity. You might think of this as as a stage director, stage manager for the, for the uh, model. Okay, and here's our model. We start with a tiny short-term read-write memory, very small, and that's our stage. And on stage, the actor can hold one chunk of information. But this is not the seven plus or minus two chunks of George Miller, but through cycling through short-term memory, we can actually simulate seven plus or minus two chunks if we wish. But since we can get away with one chunk and our idea is going for simplicity, we'll just stick with one chunk. Down below here, we have our audience and it's an enormous collection of long-term memory processes. They're parallel, um, they work, they're not connected at first, though during the lifetime of our CTM, they do become connected, um, very powerful processors. Um, we sometimes call it, like to think of these as the sleeping experts. So these are our experts in unconscious, in our unconscious memory, and they're all very powerful. And when we need them, we can actually call them up or they can, call, they can come to the stage when needed. Um, we've eliminated the central executive of bars because we can see that the central executive functions can emerge in the CTM from the LTM processors and the global workspace architecture and its dynamics. And since we don't need the central executive specifically and we can get its functionality, we've decided to eliminate it because we want to, we're aiming for simplicity. Same thing true for other control mechanisms. You might want a control mechanism for walking or movement or others. And again, we're not putting those in specifically because these kinds of mechanisms can emerge from the dynamics of this machine. And we just want to get down to the smallest basics that we need. We have an up tree here and it's a binary tree. And the purpose of the up tree is to, it, it conducts the competition. And what is this competition? So all the long-term processors wanna get their information on stage. And so they put a chunk of information containing a gist, the gist of information, the chunk contains a gist, 
with information into this competition. And uh, it's gonna move up the, the, uh, this up tree. So this is the up tree. And let me show you a, uh, an example of how this might work. So before I do, let me give you a formal definition of chunk. So um, if we have a processor P and at time T, we'll say chunk PT is a six tuple. And this six tuple consists of the address of the processor, the time the chunk was put into the competition, the gist, that's a small amount of information that the processor wants to get into short-term memory, weight, a weight is a, val a valence number, positive or negative, and it's sort of the importance that the processor gives to that gist of information. And it could be plus if it sees it's a positive uh, information or negative if it sees it negatively. And then there are a couple of other um, parameters here. Intensity, which starts out as the absolute value of the weight um, of the of the chunk and the mood is the weight. That's how it starts out. And as this chunk goes through the up tree competition, the address, the time, the gist, and the weight will stay constant, but intensity and mood will change. And let's see how that will go. So let me go, I'm gonna give you an example of a competition. Let's see if this is gonna happen. Okay, here we have a competition going up. And what I'm doing is I'm not giving you the full six tuple of the chunk that's going up. I'm just giving you a little information of what kind of information might be there in the gist, the pain, for example, here on the red thing on the left. And I'm giving you uh, the information of the mood at that time, at that node. So here we have um, pain, you can see at this left hand side, pain. Uh, and minus five, the mood at that current stage, and joy plus three. And our competition goes as follows. The one that has the largest absolute value of mood wins the competition. So pain has the largest absolute value, that's five, and it wins. And the new mood becomes the sum of the old moods, minus five plus three, and that's minus two. And that sort of makes sense because um, if you have pain and some joy, the joy will sort of mitigate the pain, the pain will go down a little bit. So one might think the mood is a little bit not as bad as it was before. And at the next stage, we have um, here uh, fear competing with pain. Obviously, the fear absolute value of its mood is highest. That will go up. And we add the two moods, and we get minus 7, which makes kind of sense, too, because you're minus 5 of fear, and now you have pain, too, to deal with. You might think that you're fear it might be increased. So this is sort of a very simple example of a competition tree. But anybody out there who's doing a little example, and I can give you one, but I'm not going to, um, but it's very easy to see, that if we mixed up these processes, we did change the order and somewhat flip things around and had a different order, um, we would get a different outcome um, here. So what would get into short-term memory would be different. And um, we don't like that. So one way, uh, our way of mitigating that is to go to a probabilistic uh, CTM. And a probabilistic CTM at each node makes a decision on the winner probabilistically. And so the way it does this is it has a coin flip neuron. At every node, there's a coin flip neuron. And the coin flip neuron takes in values A and B, and it computes probabilities, the probability of A is A over A plus B, and the probability of B is one minus that. And in this case, A and B is what we were making decisions on. So the absolute value here would have been five, that would have been A, and three would be the absolute value here. And that's how we're making a decision. So at the, the, the probability of this left-hand side would be five, mm -hmm. That was the way we made the decision over the sum of, of the absolute values, five plus three is eight. And over here, um, it would be three over five plus eight. And that's would be, so a probability of five A's that the pain would go up, probability of uh, three A's joy would go up. And so if we did the same scenario over and over again, we would see five, um, five out of eight times we would see the pain going up and three out of eight times we would see, see joy going up. And let me show you a little example of how this, this works. Um, 
So here on the left, I have a deterministic computation tree, and I'm going to compare it with the probabilistic computation tree. And on the bottom, I have four processors, and they're the same processors in both cases, and they have just A, B, C, and D with intensity. Now, I'm measuring on intensity, 3314, 3314 on both sides here. So let's looking at the deterministic one. We have to make a decision here. We also have a we build in that if there are two uh, intensities the same, we'll take the first one on the left-hand side. So A wins here, A wins, and we're adding intensities, three plus three. Here, over here, D wins, and D comes up and it has new intensity of one plus four. So that's five over here and six over here, and so A is gonna win. Now that's a little weird because D starts out with a higher intensity and three is gonna win in this configuration. Let's see what happens in the probabilistic one. In the probabilistic one, uh, let's just check D out and see what's happening. So G is gonna uh, go up with a probability of four over one plus four. So four is our value and one is the value of C. So it's four over one plus four and that's really the probability. And that will be the first probability of D going up to that first level. Now we have to multiply it by the probability of D going up to the next level. So we have its uh, intensity is 1.4 and it's competing with something with three plus three. So in fact, it's, um, the next probability will be one plus four over three plus three plus one plus four, three plus three plus one plus four. And if you compute this out, this thing, one plus uh, this five here um, cancels out and we get four over 11. So D goes up with a probability of four elevenths. If we did the same thing for A, we would say A gets probability three elevenths or three elevenths of the time will it go up. And all the others would have similarly, one C would go up with a probability of one 11. So even though it's small, it has some chance of getting into short-term memory and B would be three 11s. So we have a theorem then, of course, we have just proved essentially a theorem. Let's see if I can get it going. Yeah, so let, we're gonna call this an additive computation function. So the intensity happens to have a property which we call additive computation function. And the theorem says that for all processors P and time T, the probability that P wins the competition that began at T was, is the ratio of F of chunk, so that's the intensity, if we're looking at intensity, the intensity of the chunk to start out with over the sum of the intensities of all the chunks. And that's very nice because it says that uh, the chunks get into SDM in proportion to their importance with respect to whatever the F value is we're choosing. And hence it's independent of the submitting processor location. And I went through this now to have a, as a mathematician, one likes to have a theorem in a, in a talk and a little proof. And so here we have one. And this is a very important theorem for us. It's not at all obvious at all. So once um, a chunk gets into short-term memory, we have a down tree, which immediately broadcasts the chunk uh, down to all of the long-term processors. We could pick out special ones, but um, for simplicity, we have the chunk being broadcast to every, every processor. Um, and here's the beginning of some of the dynamics of our CTM. Prediction, we might say some of the prediction are the chunks that the processors are putting in to long-term memory. These are either answers to queries or their queries themselves or information, but you can think of them as predictive elements. And then they're getting the feedback from the broadcast and they can tell whether or not their chunk got in or not, or who got in, what got in. Um, and so we have built into all of our long-term memory processors um, some machine learning, um, and particularly we have a sleeping experts algorithm, which is due to Avonblum. And what happens with the sleeping experts algorithm is sometimes we uh, have um, a processor who is very egotistical and it'll put a very high weight on the information it gets in. And, and information may get into short-term memory. But later on along the way, some of the other processes are pretty upset that this guy got his chunk in and it was wrong. And it will send down information about it, it's wrong. So that processor now knows that it probably was uh, too egotistical and will lower its weight. On the other hand, a processor might be very humble 
and not give enough way uh, to its absolutely great uh, answer. And it doesn't get its chunk into short-term memory. It sees that. So after a while, the sleeping expert's algorithm will have it increase its weight, give it more confidence. So um, that's what the sleeping expert algorithm somehow helps balance things out. Okay, so we have input maps in our machine and they're, they go from the external world to a different processors. Here I have like an eye and an um, ear sensor and they convert the language worldish of the outside world to brainish, which is our internal language. And brainish is the inner language used by processors in CTM to communicate with each other. It's a multimodal language used to express inner speech, inner vision, and inner sensations it expressed in words and phrases called gists, which are richer and more expressive than outer languages. And having such an expressive inner language is an important uh, component of the feeling of consciousness. And we also have output maps, which go from processors uh, to actuators, which make uh, do things in the outer world, and then brainish gets translated into worldish. You might notice that the input is going directly to the long-term memory processors, and the output is going directly from long-term memory processors to the external output. There's, they're not going through short-term memory as in Barr's model. Again, this is a simplification that is perfectly fine. We, we don't need it to go through short-term memory. And in fact, for us, short-term memory is just a holding place for our conscious content. That's all it, it is. So let me just go through a little bit of the dynamics. Um, we have the input map going in from the eye and ear, and it's going to several processors. And all processes are then putting in chunks into a competition, but fear somehow wins out and its chunk gets into um, uh, short-term memory. At that point, that's being broadcast to all long-term memory processors and the inner speech processor um, responds to that. Um, okay. So notice that inner speech uh, uh, responded to fear going through short-term memory. So in part of the dynamics of the CTM is when uh, that processor A will link to processor B when B answers A's call. And this is sort of the Hebbian um, rule that neurons that fire together wire together. But more importantly for us, linking enables conscious processing to become unconscious. In other words, at first inner speech had to hear it from a consciousness that the, we were very fearful and then screamed. But after a while, when it feels fearful, when the sentient feels fearful, we'll scream unconsciously. It will just come out unconsciously because these links have formed. And so over time, links are formed between processes and turn conscious processing into unconscious processing. So I've given you the cartoon picture of the CTM. Formally, we can define it as SCM, LTM, up tree, down tree, links, input, output, seven tuple. Uh, uh, coincidentally, a Turing machine is often defined as a seven tuple. We've defined a, formally what a chunk is in our model. We have the notion of predictive dynamics in our model, prediction, feedback, and learning. Uh, we have special processes, vision, inner speech, and a model of the world. Can't go into all of those now, but um, now we're ready to define consciousness in the CTM. And we say that the chunk in STM is the conscious content of CTM. That's the conscious content. And then we say consciousness in the CTM is the awareness, in other words, the reception by all long-term memory processors of the conscious content of CTM. So when they, the, all the long-term memory processors receive that chunk that's in short-term memory, then they're consciously aware. We say the CTM is consciously aware of the conscious content. Um, and this constant activity of chunks competing to get into SDM and chunks being broadcast and chunks being broadcast and chunks being broadcast form a, a stream of consciousness. Now, these are all just definitions in the CTM. So we just definitions that we made. So we have to sort of go a little further. So I wanna give you a few examples where the reasonableness of our definition of consciousness lies in um, some of the concepts the math, the model explains easily and naturally. And uh, I'll start with blind sight, which was in the video, and I'll give you two other ones also. So blind sight is 
the condition when somebody's vision processor seems to be working fine, but they believe that they're blind. And here we have a gentleman who's sitting in a living room that looks like an obstacle course. And he's asked to go to the other room, perhaps there's food over there, and he answers, but I can't see. Then he gets up, walks to the door, and avoiding all the obstacles. What's going on? So let me give you a very high level um, explanation using the CTM. So we have that his vision processor is working fine and he's getting an input from the sensor, the eye. And he's also getting input from the outside world, maybe through the hearing processors that says, please go to the other room, which is going into vision because they're connected. And the vision processor then sends a message to the walk actuator and the gentleman gets up and walks across the room. But the connection from vision to a short-term memory uh, is broken or it's damaged. So without vision processor being able to get its chunk into short-term memory, he has no conscious sense that he can see. It's not getting broadcast down, so he has no conscious. So that's a high-level explanation of blind sight in the CTM, using the CTM. Now I'd like to go to inattentional blindness, and you've probably seen this film, which is a very famous film. The viewers of this film were asked to count how many times white-shirted players pass the ball. And um, here you can see uh, they're, they're passing a basketball. And what you're doing is you're focusing on these uh, white-shirted uh, players. And most people get the right answer, which I believe is 13. Um, and then after the film is shown, there's the question that come, came up is, but did you see the gorilla, which is all over the place here. And so what's going on? If you've seen this before, of course, you've seen the gorilla. But at first, when we are given tasks to look for, we give higher weights to those gists, to those uh, tasks, to those chunks. And we give lower weights. So we're giving high weights to white and very, very low weights to black. So we're not conscious, it doesn't quite come in. White objects aren't coming into our consciousness because we've given very, very low weights to their chunks or to their gist. And finally, I wanna look at the third example having to do again with sight maybe. It's called change blindness. And here's ex another example of the film who've done it. And here you have a detective coming into a room where a guy is obviously laid out, um, you know, he's dead on the floor. And the detective says, Clearly, somebody in this room murdered Lord Smythe. Each of you tell me your whereabouts. And he goes one to one. And now the maid says, I was polishing the brass in the master bedroom. And the butler says, I was buttering the Lord, his lordship's scones. And Lady Smythe says, I was planting my petunias in the potting shed. And the detective then says, Constable, will arrest Lady Smythe? And she says, but, but how did you know? And he says, Madam, as any horticulturist will tell you, one does not plant petunias until May. Okay, but there's a bigger mystery here going on. Here's the first scene that you saw, and here's the final scene. And obviously the detective has changed his coat and it's actually very different. Uh, it's white now, not dark. The, plants have changed. And even more, the dead guy has changed his clothes and he's, his foot is up in the air or something. And there's so many different changes. The bear has changed to a coat of armor and there's a, a tapestry that's gone to a picture and you can go through and see a multitude of changes. So again, what's going on? Why didn't we see the many changes? Well, first of all, the filmmaker was very clever and then went from a whole scene to small scenes like the, the maid and the others. So you're not seeing a flicker or a change in a particular scene, you're going to directly to a new scene. But even more importantly, we're using the same gist to describe the beginning scene and the later scene. The scene is the living room of a mansion with butler, maid and detective and a man laid out on the floor describes the first scene, describes the second scene. So in summary, uh, the CTM helps explain these phenomena very nicely, blind sight. There's a broken link or an unexistent link from the vision process to short-term memory. Inintentional blindness has to do with the weight we're given to the thing we want to pay attention to and we lower weights on everything else. 
and for change blindness. It's the gist that's important. It's the gist that, that talks about the first scene and the last scene, which is exactly the same. And so we really didn't pay attention to uh, the differences. So that's the end of my presentation. And Manuel will go to part two, where he will discuss the feeling of consciousness amongst other things. Okay, Manuel, you ready? I'm going to stop my share. Okay. Okay, I just said. Okay. You there? I'm, I'm trying to share. <laughs> okay. Uh, can you see? Can you see yeah. what's up there? Yeah. And you hear? Yes. Thanks, Lenore. Consciousness in the CTM is defined as awareness of the contents of short-term memory by long-term memory. In the CTM, all hard work is done by the processors, all of which operate unconsciously in LTM. Assuming CTM is a good model for human consciousness, we are conscious of only the gist that is sent from STM to LTM, no more, no less. What is that gist of which you are conscious? It is always one of five things, an inner voice articulating your thoughts can be one of them. An inner image, perhaps when you imagine a dream, uh, a map, or a dream image. And sensation, an inner feeling, and so on. Although consciousness in the CTM is defined to be awareness of the content of short-term memory, that definition leaves open the question, what gives rise to the feeling of consciousness? Our answer all LTM processors know what's in STM. So if any processor is responsible for consciousness, that processor knows what's going on in STM. Some LTM processors are particularly responsible for consciousness. These include an inner speech processor that translates all speech in STM brainish, the language of the brain, into an inner speech akin to what the ear hears from the external world an inner vision processor that translates all images in STM brainish into sketches akin to what the mind's eye sees in dreams. And this third is especially important. Both inner and outer sensations are broadcast from STM. All that the conscious Turing machine is conscious of in the real world and in dreams are gists from STM. This means that the gist that produce the outer images of the world are the same as those that produce the inner images, for example, dreams. I'm gonna stop for a second because I wanna, I was having trouble seeing how to get uh, full screen here. Uh, I thought there would be some place up here which says- It's okay. It's full screen. It's okay. Okay, all right, yep. keep yep. going, I'll keep going. Now for our big question, will the CTM have the feeling that it is conscious? Yes or no? We believe that yes, but how do we prove that a CTM feels conscious? We don't. The reasonableness of our definition of consciousness lies entirely in the explanation it gives for consciousness, the extent to which those explanations agree with our intuitive feelings about our own consciousness, the range of concepts that the CTM explains easily and naturally, and the CTM's response to situations unforeseen by CTM's creator. Here are some concepts explained by the CTM. Why is short-term memory so tiny? First, it ensures that all LTM processors pay attention to the same conscious thought. Otherwise, if STM contained the gist from many processors, it would be unlikely for them all to focus on the same thought. How is a math proof understood? When you have fully understood a math proof, you feel that you have its entirety in your hand. What you actually have is a gist, the idea of the proof with pointers to its definitions and levels. How do LDM, LTM processors decide what signs to give their weights? In an infant, hunger and pain are negative, food and love are positive, the infant's signs are built in. Later in life, if sign is not obvious, 
sign is taken to be that of the current mood. How are the feelings of pain and pleasure to be explained? We are not talking about the knowledge of pain and pleasure. We are talking about the feelings of pain and pleasure. Just because pain is negative and pleasure is positive does not imply CTM will feel pain and pleasure. So what does make CTM feel pain and pleasure? This brings us to the easy and hard problems. The easy problem is to make a robot that simulates feelings like those of pain and joy. The hard problem is to make a robot that truly experiences those feelings. But first, let's distinguish between simulation and experience. In the disorder called pain asymbolia, the patient knows she has pain but does not suffer. Adults who get pain asymbolia from a concussion know what pain is, claim they still have pain, but say it's okay. These people can have a root canal without anesthesia. They know they're in pain, but it's okay. They claim that their pain is still present, but that it doesn't bother them anymore. The robots we build are pain as symbolic. We know how to make robots appear to be in pain, but we don't know how to make robots feel the pain. We have four suggestions for explaining the experience of extreme pain, only four. First, broadcast. Extreme pain is an actor that takes over the entire stage. It prevents all other actors from reaching the stage. Pain messages and only pain messages are broadcast. Every processor knows of the pain. In extreme cases, nothing else can enter STM. And there's confirmation for this. Under conditions that normally cause agony, pain asymbolics can think while normals cannot. From Educational Psychology Review, The Impact of Persistent Pain on Working Memory and Learning by Smith and Ayers. Participants that identified as experiencing low levels of pain for six or more months performed significantly worse than pain-free participants on a variety of tests. However, while broadcasts account for some pain, they do not account for the sudden excruciating pain at the moment you tear a ligament. What does? Interrupts. Sudden extreme pain, a finger touching a burning stove, interrupts all unconscious processors. Interrupts, as opposed to broadcast, cause processors to instantly put their work on a stack, forces them to pay their maximum immediate attention to the cause of the interrupt. This differs from broadcast, which send their information to processors without forcing them to put what they're doing on a stack. And then there's screams of pain in brainish, which is a much richer language than simple vocal English. Uh, brainish, the, you not only hear, but you see and you feel. Uh, interestingly, a powerful vocal scream can interfere with the screams of pain in brainish generated by an LTM processor. Vicious cycles, but I won't go into that. Questions, which LTM processors are not needed for consciousness, which are needed for consciousness? The answers will help us understand consciousness better. It's very interesting that most LTM processors are not needed for consciousness. And you can go through them. For example, vision and hearing processors. Helen Keller lost both vision and hearing, but was nevertheless conscious. Some people have prosopagnosia, face blindness. They are conscious. SM had its calcified amygdala and as a consequence felt no fear, none, zip. But she was conscious. Phineas Gage lost his prefrontal cortex and a pipe went through his skull. It changed his personality, but he was conscious and so on. Here's, in fact, a picture of Phineas Gage uh, with a picture of his skull there. Which LTM processors are needed for consciousness? We believe just three are needed. The first is a model of the world processor for distinguishing yourself from what is not yourself. The second is an inner dialogue processor for planning, forecasting, and so on. It might be an English, but for a dog, it could be dogish. A broad, general, minimal ability to think, including motivation, which we consider to be energy and drive. 
what happens to your consciousness if you lose processors for model of the world and in inner dialogue. Jill Bolke Taylor is a neuroscientist who lost both when she had a stroke. She says that when you lose that model of the world, you can't distinguish yourself from the rest of the world and the world is beautiful. She lost her inner dialogue processor. It was very difficult for her to plan to do things, but she needed to get some help. Fortunately, she understood that. She had the broad general ability to think and the motivation, the energy and drive to do it. So she was able eventually to write this wonderful book. You know George Gallup's mirror test for self-awareness? It captures the three requirements for consciousness. Here's an elephant that sees a mark on its forehead in the mirror. It has a model of the world for distinguishing self from not self. When it sees the mark in the mirror, it tries to remove that mark, not from the elephant in the mirror, but from its own forehead. It has this inner dialogue for planning because to remove that mark, it has to get that trunk up there to remove it, something it has not done before. It has the ability to think, including the motivation and energy to do it. So yes, an elephant can pass the mirror test for self-awareness. Other animals do. A chimpanzee can pass that test. About fish, there's a fish that you can buy for your saltwater aquarium called the cleaner wrasse fish, small, beautiful fish. When it sees a mark on its chin, it will go off, try to rub it off, and then goes back to the mirror to check if it succeeded. There's a genus of ant called Myrmica, three species. All three have eyes. All three pass the test. You paint red paint on their plate on their forehead, and when it sees it, it tries to remove it and then checks in the mirror again to see if it succeeded. So yes, uh, there's some wonderful animals that do pass it. And uh, that's the end. Thank you. Okay. Terrific. Um, I have a feeling there are gonna be so many questions. So um, let's go ahead and get started with questions. Um, I think, Polly, can we switch over so we can see everybody now? Yeah, Manuel, can you uh, un unshare? Oh, yeah, yeah. Stop sharing. Yeah, there we go. Perfect. Okay, thank you, Polly. Um, so let's see. Does anybody have a hand up? Um, if someone wants to just jump in, okay. Uh, I'm going to say something. Oh. Um, okay. Sure. So we had a correction, and I think both Manuel and I um, made some mistakes here. Uh, somebody pointed out, Nick pointed out, that it's really Daniel Dennett, not Charles Dennett. And I think I was thinking of my friend, um, Charlie Bennett. <laughs> and it, actually, it's not George. Um, it's Gordon Callop. Callop. It's not George. I, we've made that some mistake. Manuel's made and others have. It's not George Gallup. It's his brother, I think, uh, Gordon Gallup, who talks about the mirror test. Okay. <laughs> Correction. <laughs> Okay, so let's go to questions now. So um, I think Misha had his hand up first. Yeah, I just, I'm curious because you do mention, right, the seven plus or minus two, how does this model generalize to multiple gists and um, more, more, moreover, how does it generalize to competition between staying on the short-term memory and getting off of it versus just a new object going on the short-term memory, which is more relevant for multiple because then you have to decide sort of how you allocate seven instead of I, i'd like to just quickly respond to the first the first one how mm -hmm. do we we have only one chunk in short-term memory and we feel that that's very important because i i remember when i first learned about seven plus or minus two it seemed like it wasn't enough to be able to do stuff if you reduce it to one chunk you get clearer why one chunk is enough. A chunk gets up there, it asks a question, another chunk comes up with a partial answer, it, uh, it broadcasts it, another chunk comes up with some more, and it's com completely possible in all these cases to deal with this whole sequences to, uh, with just uh, one chunk in STM. 
Yeah, no, I'll, I'll make a comment about the second one. So if you want a memory or you want an idea sustained in your head, these chunks are being, at every moment in time, chunks are being put into the competition. So a processor that wants its chunk to stay there will keep on persistently putting that chunk up with a certain weight and it will stay up there for a while. And well, you know, in another configuration of it, but essentially the same idea will be up there because the, the processors keeps on putting the same chunk in over and over and over again. So that's how you get sustained things. It's and not then, just it goes down and they completely changes its mind, we'll put something different in and, and all that. It, it, the processors have control of what they're gonna do. As far as time goes, this is all of this happens in one step in one discrete oh. time block every Yes, yes. So we're we're doing discrete time. We have a clock and we we'll, and it's in the form of milliseconds. Uh, we think it's probably a hundred milliseconds, and then a hundred milliseconds you get the next chunk, and a hundred milliseconds you get the next one and so on. Right, in our formal model, we have them all uh, working on the same clock. It could be different things, but in our model, that's the simplest thing we can do. And we do have a clock in the background. So, uh, of course, we don't have all the details here. Elon has to stand up. Uh, By the yeah. way, our paper was just published. It's online from the Journal of um, Artificial Intelligence and Consciousness. I didn't have the link here, but I possibly get the link to people so you can see the paper. He left the okay. Leo's journal. So Elon has a question. Uh, yeah, no, so I just follow. I, so I've always understood short-term memory to kind of be operationally defined as this thing that has seven units in some sense. So, it, and it really just is, a, it really is descriptive ultimately of, of, you know, behavioral performance in certain kinds of short-term memory tasks. And, I, and I'm and i wondering, you know, if you ultimately are invoking the same notion of chunk precisely, and in your case, you, you'd be saying over time in a short-term memory task where I have to repeat seven letters or seven chunks or something like that, what's happening is your cycle, that's just happening over a certain number of times, but in the end, you get the same seven plus or minus two but that's just what shows up somehow in this this cycle of uh, you know where it's where but your operation your single chunk operation is that kind of a fair characterization? Yeah, it's being so you can simulate the seven plus or minus two. I think you're saying that uh, you're giving a process to simulate seven plus or minus two, whatever you want. Right, that, that that extends over time, and then there's the, you know the real issue of what you can hold in short term memory. So but the point I think that Nathan Manuel said at the end was why is it so tiny? It's so tiny because we want to be able to focus. If you have too much stuff there, uh, you're going to be focusing all over the place and not being able to do anything. So your, your processes have to focus, focus. They can change their focus quickly, but they should be focused. I guess, uh, so what, do you mean, what do you mean by tiny, I guess, in this context? Because I don't know. One chunk. Well, it's one chunk. One is one, but but it's of, of sort of arbitrary richness in some sense in terms of you know the connections it can make to long term memory and so it is broad. There's, there's a bound on the size of a gist. Mm. Those gists have to go up. To so in the model, in the model, the gist is no larger than the sum of than the lengths of all the other information: the address, the time, the weight, the intensity, the mood, and then there's a gist, and the gist can't be larger than that. Right. The computation and, going up has to be very fast. Right, and the and this is where the complexity comes in is because uh, things have to happen fast. You can't have things too large. So the time bounds the size. The time of computation bounds the size of the way things are. Mm -hmm. uh, so that's where com the resources come in in terms of uh, the bound on size. So we have an enormous number of uh, processors, but they're only getting their information up, you know, one at a time, but at each time chunk, the time. Nisha, 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 right 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 right. Sorry, go ahead. Right. So, Another question. The LTM processors are pure functions with no external thing, and the memory is a is exactly the output of one of those without any mixing of the other's possible outputs, correct? Well, there's a lot of mixing with the linkage going in. And also we have what we call, if you look in our paper, we have a picture of what we call the extended Turing machine, where these processors, you can have Wolfram Alpha as a process, and you could have uh, Google as a process, and AlphaGo as a process. So you're allowing these processes to be very powerful, very uh, important processors, and they can then hook up and link to each other after a while. Sure. So, but do the processes have internal state or are they pure functions? They what? 
do the LTMs have internal state or are they pure functions? They have internal <laughs> state and they view them each as a Turing machine. They each have all the memory of a Turing machine and the state and uh, they're, however, they're independent. All that the CTM is doing is somehow taking lots of different processors and pulling out from them what should go into consciousness, what should be broadcast. It does a very little amount of stuff. Almost everything is being done by the processors in long-term memory. So as I said, we're only looking at the process for consciousness. And these long-term memory processes are very powerful. We're not going into each of them. We are, though, going into a few of them that we think are very important, like inner speech, inner vision, inner sensation, and model of the world particularly. So uh, those are the ones we're gonna, we are honing in on and really looking at very carefully. So um, we have a couple hands up. Um, and I better ask people to raise their hand in the program because it, we have two screens. And so I'm afraid otherwise I might miss somebody because I can't see everyone. Okay, so Mayor Dad had his hand up next. So uh, thank you very much for the interesting talk. Uh, I'm a, a junior faculty in computer science and uh, uh, I would like to mention that the uh, Bloom family have been the most influential families in, in, in computer science world. So, and the Turing Award that Susan mentioned is uh, like, Nobel Prize of Computer Science, and a lot of influential people in computer science like uh, Leonard Adelman, Shafi Goldwasser, uh, Silvio Micali, Vazirani, Moninaro. Interestingly, they have been all PhD students of Bloom family. Mm -hmm. So we teach a lot of these algorithms, complexity theories in different computer science courses. They are all invented by Bloom family. So on behalf of FAU, and myself, I would like to thank you again for accepting this invitation. <laughs> and I hope we can have you in person in beautiful Boca Raton at some point. Me too. Thank you very much, Mary Dad. Yeah, yeah. Here. In, yeah, in fact, you. they were at a talk, a center talk. That's how I met them. They went to Bernie Barr's talk. Yeah. So it's yeah. very fair to say they are godfather of computer science. And I was surprised when I could see them yeah. at the least. So, um, yeah, no, we, we are getting like these top of the line people reaching out to us and we just opened and I'm so excited and honored. Um, okay. So I think Rachel was next. Um, I hope, I hope I'm getting the, the order, right? Yeah. Hi, Rachel. Hi. Um, hi. Awesome talk. Thank you so much. Um, so I had a question. I have a lot of questions, but I guess, uh, the most important one I want to ask is, uh, talking about resource constraints. So if we have all these uh, LTM processors that are working and messages are getting broadcast and sent back and forth, to me, building this in a computational system, like in a computer, it sounds really um, resource expensive because it doesn't sound like there's a lot of resources being shared between all the different processors. So is that an assumption I'm making? Or maybe you could talk about how you can maybe limit the amount of resources required between these systems? So maybe I could answer that. You have to understand we have uh, uh, 10 to the 11th neurons in our uh, brain and we have uh, uh, 10 to the 7th processors in our brain. Each In the cortex you have these columns of neurons and each column can be viewed as a, as a processor. So we think it's a reasonable model. You have a lot of a lot of processors. So, so I think you're asking is, can some of their activity be shared? Uh, obviously that's true that, you know, especially with linkage, um, you know, that augments what one processor can do by having links to other ones. That's, that's true. But well, if we're gonna use um, external, also outside world, processors that already developed, we can make use of Alpha, Wolf and Alpha and all of these others and just plug them in. So we're not gonna do any more than in fact, what's in our brain with the 10 to the seventh processors. And some of them will be already very well developed special purpose processors. And again, um, some functionalities will be shared. Also, you see often in very, you know, 
damaged brains of younger people, um, when parts of the process, some of the processes are damaged, other processes will take their place. And that's very well known that the brain can sort of reassemble itself. And, and that's probably also because there's a lot of sharedness going on. Okay, Robert. Hey, Robert. Hello. So thanks from my side too. I'm, I'm really, uh, it's very exciting that you're here. I, I enjoyed reading your paper like half a year ago. And then I heard that you're giving the talk here. So I'm really, I'm very excited, I must say. Um, I have many questions, but I limit myself to two very brief questions. The first one is just in the question of understanding. Um, it's about brainish. Um, so if I understood correctly, the assumption is that all processors basically have the same capacity to speak brainish or understand brainish sufficiently well to communicate. Um, sure. Question is whether that's correct and whether you have thought about the possibility that there might be actually problems when they talk to each other. And the second question which I have is, is, a, bit of, is a bit more open. It's about your take on integrated information theory in relation to your model. Yeah, so I'll, I want to refer to the second question, um, IIT. So what I like about IIT, it's a measure and it's sort of measuring the kind of feedback. And I think there's a, our, well, I think our model, if we took it apart and all that would have I, I, high fi, high fi, because there's a lot of feedback going on all over the place. And I think one thing that IIT does, um, there've been some recent papers saying IT doesn't do it. You can have this model doing the same thing as that model and one has high I, one high fi and one has low fi is really saying it's not the input output map that's important for consciousness. It's really the circuitry and the way it's working that's important for consciousness. It's the kind of dynamics that's going on. And I think IIT has actually focused on that element. And so in fact, I would say our um, conscious Turing machine is probably a misnomer because it's not an ordinary Turing machine and it's not uh, conscious because it's a Turing machine. It's conscious because of its mechanisms and its architecture. Um, and so I wouldn't compare, I think calling it a conscious AI would be even much better because it's not the input output map. And so my view is that IIT does say some valuable things and they are measuring something that I think is probably very important. I'd, I'd like to go to the first question. Yeah, for the first. Okay, the first one had to do with is uh, brainish the interlingua between uh, the different processors. Each processor has its own la language inside that processor. It can do whatever, but there is this common language, this brainish, and it needs to be common because what's broadcast is in brainish. So every processor has to understand what's broadcast that brainish. And in addition, uh, uh, when, like a quest, when, when processors talk to each other through short-term memory, uh, which is, means that they're talking to each other consciously uh, using brainage, then later these processors get linked. And now they're talking to each other without going through consciousness, but they're still using the same brainish language. Thank you very much. That's interesting. And I'm next in the list, so I get to go. By the way, um, as a student of Jerry Fodor, that looks to me like a potential argument for a language of thought, what you just said. Language of thought, uh-huh. It really does. Because it sounds like you're saying that on the assumption of implementing some sort of a GW theory, you do need a sort of amodal code. Right, but we're saying not amodal, but it's multimodal. So there are, these just, this language has, it expresses sounds, it expresses, uh, you know, feelings like hot and cold, you know, if some, it's sensations, vision, pictures. I, I, I like to point out that you can get a very good sense of what brainish is like, because when you dream at night, most people have these visual dreams, that what you are seeing is just, though, the, your, it's, the brain has no input, the brain has no output, it is entirely the 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 brainish gist that are that are that your that your processors are creating. That's tricky. It's really tricky. I mean, if you talk to people like Christoph Koch, he'll tell you that the content of consciousness is sort of the back of the brain sensory stuff, and that would be in a not in a sort of 
multimodal code. Um, I mean, it's so tricky, isn't it? So some say the back of the brain and some say the front of the brain. And we're just yeah. saying, well, yeah. well, well, it doesn't matter for us because we're saying that doesn't matter. So now, interestingly, Coke would say GW is wrong and the hot zone theory is right. So, but who knows? I mean, Bernie's coming back in about a week to go through the details of this debate with us, by the way. Um, so I, I get my question real quick, real quick. I'll talk real fast. Okay, so as a philosopher, I, I just found this so fascinating and I kept asking myself why um, you're interested in this kind of project. And I know a lot of computer scientists lately have been turning to uh, you know, conscious AI, which is really intriguing. And I'm wondering, is it just to build uh, general intelligence? Is that the strategy? I know people like um, Yosha ben Bengio, who's, you know, I I'm, hope I didn't mispronounce his name, but he just had a workshop I was at on this too. Um, and I know his group's working on it for that reason, to solve some tricky, difficult problems with theoretical reasoning, causal reasoning in AI. Or are you actually trying to build a machine that has a felt quality of experience because you value that for other reasons? So I would answer several, and then Manuel has his own, and I'll tell a story that he, he won't tell. Um, so he's been interested in this since, since he's about five or six years old because his mother was told by his teacher that she should be happy if he gets through high school even. So he was trying to figure out something about the brain so he could get more intelligent. Okay, so he's been thinking about these things for many years and he wanted to study consciousness when he was an undergraduate working with Warren McCulloch and Walter Pitts. And this was in the late 50s, uh, early 60s at MIT. And, well, and Warren said to him, no, you must not work on consciousness. Uh, that's taboo, forbidden. And that's true. So it's something that he's been thinking about just because he wanted to understand consciousness. He wasn't thinking about robots or anything else from a very long time. And it's only since really we got her, read um, Bernard Barr's work that it made sense that there were some things going on that could be done mathematically. And I think Barr's work really is the first work, uh, it's not Cock and it's not these others, it's Bars who really, uh, we feel really has isolated enough so that we can start to think of a mathematical model that's uh, Turing-like in, in its simplicity. And I think that's what got us re into, into this. And, and we're interested in the idea of consciousness. So, but of course, um, conscious robots are important because for a lot of reasons, and it, it's probably true that there, it's important for intelligence, but they have to know, I think robots have to have empathy. They're gonna have to know how, how we feel, how they feel and all of that. So they're gonna have to know what pain is because it's a protective mechanism as well as you know other things. So I think that comes as part of it, but I think our original idea was just to understand consciousness and that Bars was really critical in um, us feeling that there was a mathematical theory ready to work on, that we could develop a mathematical theory. And I think the others were just too, there are too many ideas there. There are too many things going on. There are too many, is it this part of the brain or that part of the brain or what is it? Um, okay, maybe Manuel, do you wanna to add to that? Uh, nice job. Okay. Uh, the only thing I'll add is, uh, is that I really was thinking about lots of different models. When, when I learned about finite automata, I thought, oh God, that's the model of, uh, uh, that I want for consciousness, but um, it didn't, didn't work. Then Turing machines, oh, that's the model. It was only when I heard about Barr's global workspace, I realized, yes, that really is the model. And turning that into mathematics has convinced me yet that is the way to go. And you know, Stan Franklin also feels that way, right? Um, with LIDA, which is a system that he founded. Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, we, do know LIDA. we don't know him as well as Bars, um, but he actually then is bringing in uh, learning and consciousness and all that. We wanted to focus just on consciousness to start though. So we could prove theorems. And I think we're starting to prove theorems like I gave a theorem in this talk. So we're starting, we wanna be able to prove theorems about this model. So awesome. That's what do. So now Will has had his hand up, his virtual yeah. hand. 
Yeah, I just had a quick question. Um, I think you got to it earlier about the, each processor is sort of being its own little machine. So it's really sort of like a swarm of, of Turing machines yeah. that are kind of, you know, talking to each other. Um, should we think of those as sort of having, you know, like a memory mapped address where it's sort of getting in input into its memory and then the other part is reading out and in the meanwhile, it's sort of doing whatever it wants to do? Yes. Yeah. In fact, uh, these, uh, we're, we're assuming these processors are keeping uh, some intern. In fact, what we're assuming for AI is that you'll be able to ask this machine, why did it make that move in chess? And it will be able to give you a sort of overview answer um, why and what it did by looking at its, the various memories of the different processors. Uh, so somehow that's, that is true, what we're looking at. Um, yeah, there's something else I was gonna say, but it just went up into the air, I think of it. Um, so do we answer that question or do you have yeah, other? Yeah, well, so what about like, do you think if there's sort of like an evolutionary pressure on these little modules? Are they sort of all just fixed from the beginning? Can one of them say I'm not being used anymore and sort of get recruited to a new task? Yes. Yeah, so we have, we have, if you, in the next papers, you'll see that when a task comes up, when some job needs to be done, all the processors can use it whatever time they have available to work on it. And it turns out that very quickly, uh, this, the, the, uh, the, uh, this will converge on the one processor that is working on the problem that has the best answer. And that, that processor can then become uh, uh, the particular expert for that task. Yeah, I wanted to uh, go back to the swarm thing. So Bernard Bar, this is kind of interesting for us at Carnegie Mellon. Bernard Bars talks about his influence of the cognitive people at Carnegie Mellon. And it's like Raj Reddy talked about Blackboard. So that was a way of cognition of everybody can write on this Blackboard and see it. So you can see where the, somehow that idea is going into global workspace, right? Um, it doesn't have any dynamics to it. Everybody's just watching that Blackboard. But that was the beginning ideas at Carnegie Mellon and Newell and others. Um, Anderson and others picked up on this on their learning models. So there is a kind of uh, this blackboard, everybody ab able to watch it. And now with Bars's model, um, we're, and we're in it, we're um, sort of manipulating within it, uh, being very proactive. If we're, okay, won't say more. <laughs> yeah. Will, did you have another question because your hand is still up? Oh, sorry. Uh, anybody else? Elan, your hand's still up too. And okay. Yeah, sure. Can I jump in? So, so I want to go back to your uh, your examples, uh, your various uh, examples of, of phenomena that you say are kind of well accounted for in a simple way, uh, and, and they all seem to just be examples of uh, unconscious processing of some sort, where where there's it's manifest, manifest un unconscious processing. If if to sum them up, you've got your uh, in, your in, in intentional blindness, which is really just Right, change blindness, inattentional blindness, and then um, both of those, in some sense, are just evidence that people can give verbal responses uh, that, in some ways, are not well represented by the reported uh, conscious experience. So, the, in in both of these, we're we're seeing in in these examples, blindsight. I think is maybe the simplest one, is manifest behavior that's uh, where people are reporting to have lack of conscious experience. And what, what I don't understand is why, according to why you, that seems to, in some ways to be examples that would that would uh, contradict uh, what I understand of your, as the gist of your theory, which is that under circumstances where there is some sort of broadcast that's manifest in terms of an uh, overt behavior, I, I would think that that would necessarily const almost constitute where consciousness should exist, and people are reporting that it doesn't, uh, because how else do you get up and walk out the door? Um, you know, how do you how do you uh, sort of generate? A conscious uh, verbal responses without activating, you know, these this kind of this kind of broadcasting. So, if you don't have the kind of broadcasting, then you wouldn't have this uh, th this kind of behavioral response. In which case, in th that should be a, a case in point of where you should have conscious experience, and yet people report not having. And I assume your operational definition is going to come down to people saying they don't have it. Uh, you you believe the blindsided person that they don't see it, that they don't have conscious experience, and Correct. yet their behavior evoked, you know, evinces otherwise. 
Yeah, so I think that if you look at the neuroscience of line sight, it is much more complicated than this very simple model. There are a lot of things that come into play and we're, we've just simplified it, simplified it here. And again, um, these processors are linked to other processors and uh, these other processors are unconsciously. Uh, this person has said, go to the other room and uh, the vision processor talks to other processors and it activates something unconsciously and then they walk to the other room. So it's not, the, the information isn't getting up into the short-term memory, at least the information that it can see. Maybe it's the information of how to walk or uh, something else that's getting up into But I guess that's the problem though, if, you, if it has to broadcast enough, sufficiently to be able to reduce that kind of behavior, you know, all that's missing is just the verbal reportability in that case, right? And so you're getting a lot you of know, coverage. It's a verbal ability. They just don't feel that they can see. Well, they see say it. they don't see it. They say they don't, right? I mean, all we really have is... They consciously uh, don't. Well, we, all we know is that they say they don't. I mean, let's, you know, let's let's take a... Okay, well, uh, whether or not that's true, you can imagine our CTM having blind sight with that mechanism. Uh, you can imagine it. Uh, Definitely. Definitely yeah. saying, I don't have any sense I can see, and it's still doing this operation. So irrespective of somebody reporting it, you could see our CTM actually operating that way. And I think that's a nice feature. We don't have to depend on people reporting. Uh, we can look at some phenomena without, because I think a lot of consciousness is dependent on reports. And um, that's why a lot of people say that only humans have consciousness because there's no way of reporting this or finding out how other things have consciousness. Animals, for example, have consciousness. Um, we can't do tests as we can. So I think there's a huge reliance, over-reliance on reporting. That's true. I, I think that's true. But anyway, nevertheless, our CTM <laughs> has blind sight, that one. I, I got you. I think it accounts for it easier if, it just, if it's just a spoke in the wheel you can pull out that's just reportability. It's a little harder, actually, if okay. <laughs> you know, the real consciousness isn't there. In your, it seems like in your model, it should sort of be there if they're able to produce all of this complex behavior. That, that's sort of my point. Okay. Um, Misha, did you still have your hand up or is that an earlier raise? That's an additional question. Go for it. Go for it. Um, so, first of all, um, the gists are, does each LTM have a finite gist space and then say some sort of continuum of, what did you call them, weights? And also weights, you use numbers, I don't know, do they have to be a specific type of number? Uh, could they be some sort of vectors or anything with the norm? I don't know. Right. So in our simple yeah. model, it's just real numbers, positive or negative yeah. one, real okay. numbers for the weights. So is there, um, is there a reason that precludes other types of things with? Probably behavior? not. Probably not. We're just looking at the simplest one we have and seeing what we can say about the simplest model. Uh, probably, yeah, you might want to have different vectors so that if you want to do something in one way, you use this part, <laughs> something in another. But don't I, get complicated. Yeah, we, we don't want to get complicated. Numbers, and mm -hmm. they're real numbers, and there's no bound on them. But it's possible that uh, maybe some numbers get to be too large, positive, negative, and they have to be brought down. Every processor knows uh, its share of the total intensity, because that's, uh, it knows its own intensity, it knows the total sum of intensities from uh, what's been broadcast, and if the numbers get to be too large, they can all reduce their weights by a certain fraction uh, uh, to get back into the right uh, 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 range, and this is part of the model, which we did not get into. And the, um, the gists, each LTM has a Finite just space or accountable. Each LTM space. can do all sorts of stuff, but what it, there's a bound on how big the gist can be, the bit gist that it puts into the competition, or the gist that it sends uh, to a, through a link to another processor. There's but a it bound can on put that. up an arbitrary gist. It doesn't have to put up some sort of finite, you know, one. An LTM puts up one of three different gists or seven no, different right. gists. It's an arbitrary gist, but it is bounded in size. But it's discrete. Discrete. Yeah. 
Okay, so I'm going to jump in with a, another observation. Um, so earlier, I think um, you were talking about why you were interested in consciousness, which is absolutely fascinating. And you mentioned something about um, safety, you know, a sentient being. And, and I just wanted to echo that. Um, that's something I pointed out in my book. I think, you know, there's a lot of research money going into the control problem. And I'm frankly surprised that people haven't noticed that empathetic AI doesn't just require an AI that simulates empathy, but an AI that has the felt quality of experience. So, you know, the example I used in my book, that's awesome, that's so great, is non-human animals. And to the extent that humans are actually empathetic and protect, you know, the rights of non-human animals, it's because they believe the animals are conscious. And to believe that is based on their own first person inner experience of consciousness. And that's not something you can simulate at too coarse of a level of grain so that you just have a machine that has what is often called access or functional consciousness. You have to actually achieve what philosophers call phenomenal consciousness. And that's hard. Um, I think it's going to be a lot harder than creating AGI. Um, that's just my own feeling. But I think that could be the holy grail of AI safety for w when it comes to the control problem issue. Uh, that's, that's my own suspicion. Mm -hmm. Oh, good. Thank you. That's a very good point. And I've been emphasizing empathy lately with that. And uh, you're giving me more reason to why it's important. Yeah. The trick's going to be determining when that machine truly has the felt quality of experience because yeah. a machine that has a sophisticated functional or access consciousness will behave as if it's conscious. Even uh, so, let, let me, I'll, I'll, speak, I'll speak to that. I'll speak to that. I, our interest has been in pain and pleasure. Mine, in particular, is pain because when you have pain, it's very hard to think that that is not real. Pain is real. And my sense of when I under, I, I, uh, when we started doing this, I, I, I said to myself, I will, when, when I've understood pain, which is what I want, I want to be able to understand it. When I've understood, I'll either know, I'll be able to uh, take any pain at all, or I'll know why I can't. And I really tried to, wanted to be able to understand it and hoped that I would understand it to the point that I could just stop it completely, like the Buddhists who put themselves on fire. And I cannot. I went to, I had a, my tooth drilled the other day and I could not stop the pain. And I can guarantee you that even though I have some idea of how pain is generated, I do not have the answer. Okay, so let me tell you about what this bright guy did. He decided to have two fillings without having any painkiller at all. Oh, test it out. Uh, <laughs> test this out. Science, <laughs> so science. yeah, <laughs> I know. I had to live with that. Well, I, and I couldn't stop the pain. So. <laughs> Do you think Buddhist monks can? <laughs> what? Do you think Buddhist monks can? Do you think that they can uh, experience that burning without pain? Do you actually believe that? Well, uh, I have seen the Buddhists burn themselves. Oh. Uh, maybe, maybe they took some painkiller beforehand, and I don't know. <laughs> they claim that they did not. On the other hand, the Dalai Lama says he can take a pain, uh, 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 you know, the usual pain levels are zero to ten. He can take a ten and bring it down to a three. He can't bring it below that. You you can prepare yourself by uh, doing hot sauce. Hot sauce, <laughs> seriously, hot sauce is great for trying to understand the qualia of. Uh, I don't know. I'm not good doing those experiments in our house. Sorry, <laughs> no more experiments. Somehow, this is all making me want Mexican food. Right. <laughs> so, Michael Solomon, and then we. I think we have to wind things up to be timely. You know, to to, to end on time. Um, Michael, did you have a question? Oh, you're unmuted. Uh, yes, oh. I, I unmute. I'm sorry. Okay, okay. I'm thinking of the evolutionary benefit of consciousness. And I'm wondering, do you think that 
there are degrees of consciousness that animals or plants have a different level of consciousness because their processors are different or because they just have different mechanisms? IIT measures consciousness. It says that even a thermostat has a small epsilon of consciousness. So by IIT, some animals have a lot more consciousness than others. But your model agrees with that. Uh, I don't know if our model agrees with that. Um, no, no, I, I think I think that I, I agree with that. Now, if we, we use IIT as a measurement, and I mean phi as a measurement, um, then we do agree, I think that. So if we agree that phi is the right measure, which I think probably is, but I'm not totally sure, then that's probably true. Did, did you read Scott Aronson's blog entries on? Uh, yeah, 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 we know Scott and we know all that. Yeah, so all of it back and forth, right. It um, may be necessary, but not sufficient. I don't know. So I would I'd like to end by saying, as I said in my part of the talk, that uh, I see this and we see this as a framework for um, people to work coming from theoretical computer science to work on a model of consciousness. And of course, there are all sorts of parts of this that aren't developed yet. You know, brainish, for example. Um, I've been looking at different things, like we have this uh, student who works with us who does multimodal processing for uh, machine learning and asking, well, is there a multimodal language exactly? No one's developed a multimodal language really, or even some outline of what that might be. So we are teaching a short course in starting April, I mean, for all of April, today's April 1, uh, in Peking University. And we have about 30 very, very, very smart undergraduates. And they're, for four weeks, they're with us. And at the end of four weeks, their teams of students, they all have to come out with a research project. So they're all working on different aspects of this. And we've done this last year. And so I think if you talk to us in one month, we may have some more uh, actually developments in the different areas. So we're sort of excited about that um, part. So there are so many parts to work on here, so many. Manuel, you wanna say some things? No, I'm just saying enough. <laughs> you know, you know. Well, I'd like to thank everybody for great, 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 great questions and discussion. So thanks for letting it go. I mean, I know we went longer than we thought we would, but thanks for letting this go ahead. I don't have a question. I just wanted to thank you so much. Sure. I really have a chance. Yeah. I'm too excited to jump right in. I really wanted to say thank you so much. It's such an honor and a pleasure. Uh, to oh, have it's you. our honor. It's our pleasure. We really beginning of this conversation. I mean, I, you know, I think we all know that we could just keep going indefinitely. So let's do that. Uh, yeah. soon. Let's do it on, on a boat, on a patio. Uh, <laughs> uh, it'll be great to talk in person. I, this is just so exciting. So thank you. Yeah, thank you so much. This was really fun, really. Thank you for coming. It was really wonderful. We really yeah. enjoyed it thoroughly. Thank you. And that's why we really wanted to have to see everybody so we could sort of see people. So thank you. Great thank audience. You so much. Look forward to speaking with you again soon. Yeah, thank great. you. Thank you. Thank okay. You. Bye, everyone. Bye.